Good morning, everyone. Welcome. We have a lot. We have a lot to cover today, so we'll get started. Come on in. At TAs, if you're missing some of your folks, you might want to just keep an eye out up there, see if you see them coming in. You can welcome them into your new section. Thank you. All right. So here we are. We are getting started on part three of the course. Um, so before we do that, I have a number of announcements, opportunities for you that you might want to know about uh, tonight or and or considering it tomorrow morning. There's a full moon eclipse happening at 4 o'clock a.m. If you want to check that out. Full moon eclipse happens twice a year and you might want to might want to check it out. Tomorrow, happening at Shavers Creek, there is RPTM 456, which is an event planning class. And they are going to be, they have planned an event tomorrow at Shavers Creek from 4 o'clock until 7 o'clock. Mental health awareness event, nature and wellness activities, food, prizes, I mean s'mores. How could you miss out on that? So if you want to jot that down, um, 4 o'clock to 7 o'clock tomorrow at Shavers Creek. Support other Penn State students. It's a good thing to attend after you vote tomorrow. Extra credit movie coming up a week from today, November 14th, 7 o'clock at 106 Osmond. And of all of the extra credit films that we show during the course of the semester, um, this, I think, is the most important. I find this to be a very powerful and eye-opening uh, eye movie that, um, that helps to inform where we are here in part three of the course, things that we can do, things, ways that we can look at um, what we're doing in different ways. So come watch this movie, be part of the discussion following. I highly recommend. Coming around in your section today, there are six clipboards, one for each quadrant, each section of the room. If you're curious about becoming a TA, uh, sign up for a conversation. So those clipboards are coming around, put the information on there and someone will reach out to you. So if you sign up, please be watching for emails from me about signing up for a conversation. Because you're signing up for a conversation doesn't mean that you're making a commitment, right? It's a conversation. It's a two-way kind of thing. We ask you some questions. We give you the opportunity to ask questions. and so. That's the way that the TAs that you have started their process. Then there's a semester long training, and so next fall you would be TAs in this room. So watch for that clipboard coming around in your section. This won't be the only opportunity to sign up. It's the only day that we're going to pass the clipboards like this, but certainly if you have interest, if you have questions, please send me an email. Um, we, can, we can figure this out together. So I'd love to have a whole bunch of you. I need a whole bunch of you. So, And Interpreting Maple Sugaring to Families, it's a two credit class, AEE 297. Um, it is a class that runs in the spring, runs mostly on Tuesday evenings, and then you get to talk to people about maple harvesting. It's, um, it's a great way to earn two credits, uh, and, and it's a great way to be outside, doing something interesting, learning something new. And so if you have questions about that, you can contact loon at psu.edu. You can't register for the class, but she'll put you in it. So if you have questions about this, you can come up afterward 
and I'd love to chat with you about that as well. Okay. And then, getting into where we are for today. We're on page 108 in our journals. Um, and so we're, we're here in part three. So the whole evolution of the course of how we're connected to each other, to ourselves, to the natural world, part one. Part two, so what's happening to those connections? It's the, the challenge, challenging part of the semester, all the bad news kinds of stuff. And now we move into part three. How are we going to respond? What are we going to do with what we know at this point? Okay. We have impact every moment of every day, somehow. We're impacting something, someone, somebody, some place. And so I understand that from the conversations we had last week at the unexam, particularly, that some of you are feeling empowered and some of you are feeling helpless. So I want to talk, speak to this, this idea, this um, way of thinking that can be considered as learned helplessness. And it comes about, it's, you know, when people are feeling helpless, they perceive that no matter how hard they try or no matter what they do, it's not going to make a difference, right? So people then tend to give up or they accept their fate, fall into a state of inaction when you're feeling helpless. It can lead to depression and anxiety and a lowered sense of self. So a lot of this psychology around learned helplessness happened in the 1960s. It was a really important time when people were kind of confronting these challenging ways of being that they were seeing in the world. And so sometimes the helplessness that we experience, you know, sometimes as a kid, I would see those, those commercials on TV of the starving children that needed help around the world and hearing from adults that said, well, it, it, there's nothing that we can do about that. You know, you can send in your 52 cents a day or whatever they were asking for pledging, but it's, it's not gonna make a big enough difference. And so sometimes our helplessness is directly told to us, that's not gonna make a difference. But how do, can we face that on our own, you know? being heartbroken from what we're seeing on the screen, are we really helpless? Or can we make cho choices throughout our lives that can help what's going on in those situations? So it, we carry these stories really deeply within us. Module 12 in Canvas, I've put up a couple of articles about this if you want to explore those more. But what I can say is that there are enough people that there, are, there is change ahead, right? We can make these changes. We can feel empowered by things that we do. We can unlearn that helplessness. We've talked about that unlearning. And so, so how are we gonna do that? That's what this part three is about. What kind of changes have you already made what kind of changes can you make that will impact your lives, the lives of people around you, and potentially the lives of, of animals, plants, people, even at a distance, right? We can be the people that are making change. So the way we're gonna dive into this to begin with is starting with food. Um, food is about one third of our ecological footprint. So when you did that eco footprinting back in week nine in your labs and learning about what your, your choices, how your choices impact the amount of resources that you as one person require, um, we can see that food is about a third and then transportation and shelter are the big pieces of our ecological footprint. So today we're gonna dive into this as far as what, what impacts um, our food choices, right? You might remember this back from um, our class about birth and death. 
Earth, water, fire, air, and space combine to make this food. We take the lives and labor of numberless beings that we may eat. May we be nourished that we may nourish life. May we be nourished that we may nourish life. Now today, I mean, there's a lot of different ways you could take that question. Specifically today, I want to think about your nourishment. What has nourishment looked like for you in the way of food? How have you chosen what you put in your body? So take a moment and brainstorm that on your notes page for today. What has impacted the nourishment that you've chosen? Think about your favorite foods, think about your least favorite foods. Think about what you've eaten today. What impacts that? So what, what is this for you? What has impacted the food that you've nourished your body with over the course of your lifetime? The microphones are out. Yes, ish. Well, before college, uh, <laughs> I was able like to sit down and have like a well-cooked meal, like fruits, vegetables, like the whole shebang. Um, but now in college, I just, it's, I'm str currently struggling trying to have the time to do the same thing I did in high school because I'm doing so much more, like a class, schoolwork, uh, football, uh, clubs. Just never have the time I just sit down because I'm always on the go and yeah. yeah. So currently I'm just trying to eat whatever like goes by makes me full and then try to make it up with like physical activity that's even started to become a struggle too but I'll yeah. figure it out I hear you we'll all figure it out go ahead um, college has made my food choices much more dictated by money than um, in the past and so mm -hmm. that causes me to not eat as healthy as I used to yeah so what what dictated before college even um, what we had in the fridge, mm -hmm. what, what my parents bought. Um, or if I went out, that's when I usually like ate less healthy, but now it's kind of just whatever I can access and it doesn't break my wallet. Yep, I hear you. Yep, right behind you if you pass the mic back. So um, before college, I would say that it was home cooked meals and like, I don't know, meals cooked by my mom or something mm -hmm. like that. Um, but after coming to college, it's like um, whenever I get time, like just going, picking up some food from somewhere. So pretty much what Ish and August said as well. Yeah. Um, because of the time and money factor, mm -hmm. um, it's hard to cook for yourself and get good amount of nourishment here. But back yeah. home, it was way nicer, definitely. What was your favorite food that your mom cooked? Um, so where I'm from, like, the name is a little different, but it was kind of like a beef stew that my mom would cook, mm -hmm. which I was a big fan of. So it was like, um, that is, that's definitely something I miss a lot. 
Mm. Um, but yeah. Thank you for you. sharing. Yeah. Places. Um, when I lived with my when I lived with my parents, like they would, my dad would say that they would live to eat, like they would enjoy what they ate. And now, in college, I eat to live. Mm -hmm. So, that's interesting. Thank you, Maddie. Yeah. Yes. I thought found it way easier to eat like stuff that was grown closer to home. So like we had a garden in our backyard when I was at home, but now mm. it's a lot of. If I'm buying produce, I don't know necessarily where it's from, and it's mo more than likely not from PA. Yeah. Um, but then, aside from that, I do see a lot of economic value in food. So, my entire apartment all buys food together. So it makes it even, even harder to be like, oh, this is really expensive, and like it's not just me that it's affecting; it's other people as well. Interesting. Thank you for sharing that. So it's the community aspect too. Yeah, both ways, before and now. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Food is just expensive, so I just be trying to like find what I can do to make it like last through the week, so mm -hmm. I can still cook for myself. Yeah, thank you. It is, and it's become even more expensive over the course of this semester. Prices have even gone up more and more. So, thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Anyone else? Yes. Yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Um, so I became pescatarian like five years ago, uh, but then like over a course of years, like uh, I, anyway, uh, my nutritionist like saying that I need to like start eating like more meat, mm -hmm. and like uh, so I started eating like chicken again. Mm -hmm. uh, I still don't eat red meat like that's too much for me. <laughs> Why is it too much? Uh, I feel really so bad for like all the animals that. Yeah. Humanity is like growing and just to eat them, it's, it's a lot. It is a lot. I hear you. Yes, thank you for bringing that up. We're going to dive more into that too soon. Hello. So Hi. just recently, um, I was diagnosed, or I, I guess for my whole life, I didn't know I had celiac disease. So my lifestyle completely changed. Like I used to go on a budget, like get whatever was affordable, but now like not being able to consume gluten and trying to budget that was extremely hard. So my body this whole time has been malnourished for so long that now like I'm eating extremely clean and healthy, like a bunch of vegetables, a bunch of fruits, clean yep. proteins, things like that. Things that I would have looked aside and didn't really think much about because I was a college kid, I want what's cheaper. Now I have to do to in order to nourish my body again so yeah. new journey but something new to work on and really important to listen to that yeah so lots of different things that are playing in right it could be family traditions it could be health reasons it could be ethical choices it could be gardens that you had access to and all of those things are true for all of us, right? They play into our food story in so many different ways. It could be you know, something that your family specializes, like a special meal that, that nourished your body, right? It could be that your grandma is a great baker, and so you got baked goods. As a, like all of these things that, that influence how we nourish our bodies. And I want to say that every person in this room, whatever you're studying, psychology, sociology, economics, genetics, family studies, marketing, communications, criminology, material science, whatever you're studying has to do in some way with food. It is either the process of making it, the process of getting it, the process of transporting it, the process of growing it, I think it's fascinating that food is such an underlying commonality, whether it's you know, not just the fact that we all need to eat, but that we all are part of that process. So what is food? We've never had before a greater diversity of foods. We have never had more harmful food. We've never had everything in such abundance. Even as late as the 1990s, the average grocery store carried 7,000 different items. And now, today, it's somewhere between 40 and 50,000 choices that we have to make at the grocery store. 
So we're going to go through some of these choices and what influences the choices and how it's affecting the world around us. So first we're going to look at potatoes, one of the most versatile foods, right? So potatoes. And what's going on, if you grow potatoes in your backyard or know somebody who does, those potatoes, you're putting in one calorie of energy for every 20 calories that you're getting out. So you're, you're not putting in much energy, right? To plant a potato, all you do is like cut the, that little eye out of the potato and put it in the ground and it sprouts a new potato plant. It doesn't take a lot of energy to do that. Okay. So then, if we're considering potatoes that are in the grocery store, then we're putting five calories of energy in for every one calorie of energy out. So we've already flipped the scale, right? Before we were putting in very little energy, and now, if we're buying potatoes at the store, we're getting less out than we're putting in already. And then we go to this, french fries, which I have to admit are one of my favorite foods. It was probably my first solid food, according to my family, because my grandma would sneak them to me in the back seat. Um, so for french fries, we're putting 10 calories of energy in for every one calorie of energy out. So even more steps, more processing to get french fries. And then we go to the potato chip, and then we're even doubling that. Even more steps, more packaging, more transportation. And so we're just um, decreasing what we're getting out as we put more and more in. And that's because of this, right? It's because of this. So if you're planting them in your backyard, you're cutting the little eye out and putting them in the ground. If you're getting ones that are raised on the farm, then there's lots more equipment that goes into it. The planter, and then the harvesters, and then you're gonna potentially the pesticides and herbicides, and then watering. All of that takes a lot more energy if you're doing it on the farm, and all of that is based on the oil, right? It's all based on this production and technique um, that requires a lot more energy in to produce on a large scale. Machines to plant, harvest, apply those things, water, pesticides, herbicides. So the processing costs are higher, and the transportation costs are higher, the packaging costs are higher, and so all of these need those fossil fuels. So already we can see that there's a story here that then yields potato chips, which are more like, oh, I should say, re your return on investment. Again, talking about these homegrown potatoes, pretty close to zero dollars a pound. You buy one potato at the store or save one from last year's garden, you plant it, and then it just goes up and up according to how much processing goes in, right? And that's where we can talk about food-like substances. Michael Pollan is a, an author that writes a lot about food and food choices. And potatoes are food, but are potato chips food? After all of that processing, all of that energy, they do give us calories, right? They do give us the energy, but it's actually way less nutrition that we're getting out. So a tip that really helped me that I learned, if you pay attention to shopping the edges of the grocery store, think about the grocery store you visit most regularly when you're here. You know, I often, it leads me right into the food and produce, excuse me, the produce, fruits, vegetables, that aisle. And then if I turn around, then I'm gonna find the meat. And then if I skip all the middle aisles and go down the other side, then there's the dairy and eggs and things like that. And so by skipping all of those middle aisles, then I'm skipping more of the processed stuff. All of the fresh stuff, more of the real food is on the edges. But it's true that not everybody has access to these grocery stores. Could you play the first 55 seconds of that video for me? We're just going to do a little teaser of this video. It's highlighted in your module this week, so you can check out the rest if it intrigues you.
been watching TV all day, get off the couch. You know what? Why don't you get up and go to the store and bring back some food? check out the rest of that video. We have so much we're going to do today. It's called Food Fight. And it brings to light the idea that not everyone has access to fresh food for a variety of reasons. So what you eat and how much you eat obviously impacts your long-term health in a lot of ways. Healthy eating habits are important to prevent a long list of ailments, right? But if people don't have access to that fresh food, it's, it's just not that simple. Millions of people in the United States live in areas called food deserts, places where they don't have access to this fresh food. They don't own a vehicle and live more than a mile from the nearest grocery store. People of the po poorest socioeconomic status have 2.5 times the exposure to fast food restaurants compared to those living in the wealthiest areas. Low-income zip codes have 30% more convenience stores, which tend to lack healthy items. 150 to 200 jobs can be created by, cre by building a, a large retail grocery market. So there's ups and downs to this, right? We need to find ways. It is important, and we've said this before, there are enough resources on this planet, and that includes food. There are enough resources on this planet for everybody, every person on the planet to live a healthy and nutritious life. But the global food supply is simply inequitable, deeply inequitable. So these food deserts are a real issue here. Finding food, finding, and it sounds like some of you are describing, you know, I, the possibilities of what you're finding to eat. And is it that there, the time that you're, you are having, the time that you're choosing to put into your food, the time that you're going to the dining hall and what choices they're offering there? So how is it that we can think about the equity of food, how to make it available to all people. And it makes me really sad. It kind of makes me want to cook you all a big pot of soup and like sit together and eat. Um, so how is it that we can do that? Something else we need to consider is that our food is coming from quite a distance. So you all don't know that part of my food story is that my grandpa, who I deeply adored, my grandpa lived to be 99 years old. Part of his routine every day was taking time to sit and enjoy a cup of coffee and have a cookie and to be neighborly with his, you know, people that are walking by, whatever, whoever those people are, with his family, if we happen to be there with him. And so today I brought my coffee and cookie snack. This has become part of my routine as well. So I have my, my cookie here, and I have my coffee, and I need you to think about what has gone into this snack, right? The possibility of having these items. The butter in the cookie is from the milk from cows. The sugar comes from Brazil, the sugar cane that has been harvested, milled, refined, and bleached. The molasses, that comes also from Brazil. It's a BIPOC product of the sugar production process. The egg is from chickens. Actually, these eggs are from local chickens. Um, 
And so that it takes the chickens and the people that raise those chickens, right, to bring these, this possibility to me. The vanilla grown off the, uh, in Madagascar, off the coast of Africa, vanilla beans that are painstakingly grown and conditioned, and then soaked in vodka, which comes from the distillation of cereal grains or potatoes that have been fermented, and then that happens someplace else and baking soda, which is a man-made chemical. It's made with a chemical reaction, or it can be mined. There is a baking soda mine in Colorado. And then the wheat. Where was this wheat? I don't know where this came from. The wheat berries were harvested, grown, harvested, and ground. Um, and then vitamins and minerals get added back into the wheat because as you process it, that stuff gets lost. So then people add it back in. That's why it's called enriched flour. They've added things back in to make it more healthy. The ginger was grown in India or China, Nigeria or Indonesia. And it, it's from the root of the ginger plant that gets ground up. Cinnamon grown in Indonesia. Spice is made from the bark of the cinnamon plant. And salt was either mined or produced by the evaporation of seawater. And then my coffee. Coffee has become a really interesting story in my family because my brother owns a coffee roastery. But the coffee that he gets is from small farms all over the world. But he calls it relationship coffee because he is in direct communication with the farms where the coffee is grown. So this particular coffee was grown by a man named Emilio in the country of Honduras, and he is a friend of my brother's. And so this coffee comes a long way, and through a lot of different connections, through a person that I love dearly, into my cup, so that I can have it with my snack. So thinking about the number of miles that the ingredients in my cookie have traveled can be quite remarkable. So. The miles are one thing, but the people, all of the people that were involved in the processes for all of those different ingredients. So when you look at you know, the ingredients on your, on your protein bar and you wonder what they are and where they came from, it might be interesting to start to look into what's in the food you're eating, where it came from, how it got to be in your hand so that you're going to put it into your body. It's pretty astounding. So thinking about this awareness, consider your favorite food and consider the processes that went through before it got to you. Take just a quick moment to talk to your neighbor about this. Right, and somebody kindly already brought this up. What about meat? This class wouldn't be very thorough if it didn't include this. It's a very common question. What's the impact of meat? Eating meat was a topic there in your eco footprint. It uses loads of resources and energy and land. And as 
Americans, we consume about 9.5 billion animals. Do you get that? 9.5 billion animals annually in the United States. So the video I'm about to show comes with a trigger warning. Um, if you need to close your eyes, do that. But it tells us about what's happening in the industrial meat processing.
So what are the impacts of that industry? Way more water consumption, water pollution, land use, deforestation, climate change directly connected to all of those other pieces, right? Because of what we consume, 9.5 billion animals in the United States alone. And what's the impact of those workers on those workers? So it doesn't show in here who's killing the animals, right? Who's actually killing them? In an average cattle slaughterhouse, the employee tasked with firing the bolt gun that kills or incapacitates each cow sees about 2,500 animals each day the rate of one cow to kill every 20, excuse me, every 12 seconds. Violent, physically demanding work. High rates of serious injuries in slaughterhouses, high pressure, repeti repetitive and strenuous work, elevated risk for bacterial infections, the psychological toll, needing to disassociate themselves from their work so as to suppress feelings of guilt especially when committing these violent acts. Higher aggression, anxiety, hostility, PTSD, higher substance abuse and addiction, higher arrest rates. The environmental impact, the social and human impact, the animal impact, it brings about all kinds of things that we've been talking about. And then brings me back to the question that I asked you in the week of the birds, why care? Why care? So you might want to consider that. Food waste in the United States is excessive. 40% of the food produced is wasted. 133 billion pounds of it. All of this goes back to that energy that's consumed to produce the food, right? So they're all of the story, all of the really horrid stories in our food production. But what if we can see other parts of the story? You know, thinking about that new story that we're working on here in part three. There are some movements about this, and you can be part of them. You can choose to be part of that. What's another story? So it was, um, it was a long time ago that uh, Earl Butts was the Secretary of Agriculture in 1971. He held that position f for five years. And in that, um, in that time, the domestic farm policies changed. It shifted to favor the large industrial operations, not just meat, but also corn and soy. And the smaller farms were shunned at that time. And so we've created this system, there's this heavier ecological toll because of the food that is produced and those policies that came around 50 years ago and how the story has changed. So what is organic, right? We hear about it a lot. Relies on fer fertilizers of organic origin, compost such as manure and bone meal, places techniques on crop rotation and companion planting, biological pest control. Organic agriculture is a production system that sustains the health of the soils and the ecosystems and the people, right? the people that are producing it, but also the people that are enjoying it that are nourishing themselves with it afterward. You can be part of this. There's a farmer's market in town that happens every Friday. You can visit, it goes from 11.30 to 5.30. Even in the winter months, it moves inside to a building on Allen Street. So you too can be part of the farmer's market. The benefits of farmer's markets, direct connection between the producer and the consumer, it encourages the local economy, right? People aren't driving here from 500 miles away to participate in this. It's all local stuff. There's less oil input, therefore, and it's awareness and choice to live lighter on the land. 
In addition, sociologists have counted conversations that have happened in farmer's markets, and there are more person-to-person -person connections than at conventional grocery stores. When you're talking with the people that have grown the food that you're going to take in. There are also areas here with community-supported agriculture. There are a number of these nearby. And so if you work for your food, you work for three to four hours a week, and then you get to take home a food share, a box of the vegetables that were grown on their farm, they're here. You don't have to go far to find them. There's the student farm. There's the contact there, Leslie Pillen. Um, really important, cool lady to know um, who runs the student farm. And you too can have a plot there. And the benefits of working the land, working the soil, turns out that getting dirty in the garden is really healthy for you. There are microbes in the soil that are good for your mental health. So those people that say, I love my garden, like it's my, it's my quiet place, it's my feel good place. And that could be because of what they're doing but it could also be because of the act of gardening. So diverting the food waste could cut the number of food insecure Americans in half. So thinking about what you take on your plate and then what you throw in the trash and how those things are connected. Um, so that is another way, something else to consider in the food systems. And all of this comes together. Like, you don't have to wait to start this stuff. You can start being more aware of your choices as you walk out of this room, as you head to get your breakfast or your lunch very soon. What kind of containers are you consu consuming it in? You can think about reducing your food waste. You can think about where your food is coming from. You can think about how much meat you are taking in where that meat is coming from. You can adopt some more traditional, like the Mediterranean diet, where you're eating more fruits and vegetables, eating things in moderation, things like meat and eggs and cheese and yogurt, cutting more of the sugar out of your diet. So there are things and choices, and this is something that you can talk about this week during your eco meal. We, we still have a minute. I, I won't be late. I'm watching. So considering that we have action and or reaction choices, there are things that you can talk about this week at your eco meal. We all eat, and it would be a sad opportunity to eat badly. So it's about togetherness. It's about sharing. It's about being um, more healthy when we eat together. So I want you to consider all of those things. It's a lot in today's class, a lot of possibility. And what is your response to all of this? Considering that we'll have another class on Wednesday, this is your pack back question. You might want to wait till Wednesday and sort of put together what's coming up for you in both of those classes before you answer. And I hope that you have a good, nourishing kind of day.